Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the second kind of uh, Young Surgeons uh, Conference. Uh, this is the uh, CME slide here. Uh, remember that um, at the end of the meeting, there will be information in order to uh, receive CME credits as well as in the uh, chat box. This is information for our next meeting next month. Uh, the guy on the uh, left looks very familiar. He'll be giving a lecture on social media as well as Dr. Uh, Peter Derman. So uh, really looking forward to uh, tonight's um, event. We have a very uh, um, impactful and um, you know, uh, information for you know, the students out there, med students, residents, when you're considering looking for fellowships, when you're ranking your fellowships, as well as when you're choosing your job. I'd like to welcome my uh, co-hosts and uh, co-chairman, Dr. Hobson, Sandy Hobson, spine surgeon um, in, at Emory, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Burleson, who's a, a spine surgeon in Nashville. Um, we have uh, Dr. Chester Donnelly, who's a, a spine surgeon as well out in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he's gonna be up first talking about ranking fellowships and then Dr. Burleson will be talking about things that we need to, to consider uh, when choosing a job. And this is uh, you know, something that uh, is kind of near and dear to all of our hearts just because we have just went through this process. So really looking forward to tonight. Put your questions in the uh, chat box, as well as if you raise your hand, uh, we will get you up into the um, panelists kind of area where we will try to get to your question. So the format, two 20 minute talks followed by a Q and A at the end. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Donnelly to talk to us about what should we know about uh, when considering ranking the spine surgery fellowships. Thanks Antonio, I appreciate it. So just a little bit background on myself. I put some of it in context. We could advance to the next slide. Would be kind of my background. So for the most part, uh, my residency was all five years at University of Miami. It's right in my orthopedic surgery residency. Had a great crew there and great views, of course, being in Miami. That then shifted to going to Philly, the Rothman Institute. Had another pretty good crew there and not so good views. Uh, also had to deal with a lot of crazy people in Philly, but otherwise it was all pretty good. And now I'm in a private practice group in Dallas where I kind of control my own time and my views for the most part consist of either seeing patients in clinic, sometimes in the OR and the golf course. So as a background, I'm gonna go through 10 things that I think are extremely important in ranking a fellowship. Kind of the disclaimer I always give to anyone whenever I'm giving advice about something, it's just my own opinion. I'm not an expert in it. And if I was, then I probably should be doing that instead. I've only done one residency. So my uh, experience on which or sorry, run fellowship. My experience of which fellowship to do is very biased based on the experience I got from my own fellowship. So, you know, these are things I think are really important, but I'm probably leaving out one or two things or one thing that's on there is probably not as important. So, and this is not necessarily a ranking of what's the most important. Uh, the thing that I do think is quite important though is the number of co-fellows. So most spine fellowships take one to two, some take up to four to five. I think the importance of this is uh, the volume that your program gets is also correlated with the volume of fellows you have. So if your program has a lot of fellows, it somewhat implies that in terms of uh, the surgical volume that it can support that many fellows. It also implies that it's relying on a lot of fellows in terms of the autonomy. It means that the attendees are probably running two rooms because they need those fellows to have additional uh, rooms going at the same time. But uh, there's also drawbacks, which I'll get to also. The other nice thing about having a larger fellowship is you have more fellows to kind of uh, discuss cases with during the years. You have more of a support system. Even the first few years, I have a group chat with my awesome uh, three co-fellows and we're talking about cases every single day and we're just talking about life things every single day. So it's really nice to have that support system. It's also nice uh, going to a bigger fellowship. You have a big alumni network. It's that many people graduating each year that are kind of touting your brand, touting the things that you have. Uh, but there's advantages of a smaller fellowship. If it's just you, you can kind of cherry pick your cases that week. You can see what are the big cases every single day and you can make sure that you're the one that's scrubbing those cases. You don't have to do the same um, basic adult degen cases. You can do the more complex or the more deformities based cases if that's what you want to do. There's also nice things where you can really learn or MIS skills if you're in a smaller fellowship because those are the things you want to see. So some of the other drawbacks is kind of I mentioned is that if you have a larger fellowship, you know, that's less time that you're on trauma call. You're splitting that 
entire year either by three or by four as opposed to maybe by one or by two. Uh, that's less experience managing complications. There's less time seeing rare pathologies. Uh, also with the larger fellowship, it's less ability to go scrub the better cases that week and that day. And also if you're in a large fellowship, again, it implies that they really rely on you being there. It's kind of hard to miss uh, times for events. Uh, it is nice when you can do cases with your co-fellows. It's a great way to learn from each other. Uh, you're not really ever double scrubbing a case. This just comes to a rare instance and thought it'd be funny to take a picture of them scrubbing together. Uh, ACGME accreditation is kind of a weird topic. You know, for recon and sports, I think almost all of those fellowships are accredited. In spine, maybe about 50% of the fellowships are accredited. In theory, I say this really doesn't matter. I had never, when I was on the interview trail, even knew if a fellowship was officially accredited or not accredited. I kind of broadly would say it really doesn't matter for spine at least. Um, some of the advantages of going to a non-accredited fellowship is that as a fellow, you're a junior attending, and so you get attending privileges. And the reason that's important uh, when you're looking at programs is you can actually time out cases as an attending. Therefore, if you're timing out the case, that means the attending isn't necessarily in the room. They're probably on campus, but not necessarily in the room when you're starting. So it's just that much more autonomy and implies that maybe your attending will be in the other room when they're starting. So it's just more time for you to kind of learn independently uh, additionally, when you're managing traumas and overnight things, if you're able to time out on your own because you're at a non-accredited place, that means you can do more cases solo. You can do more things like washouts. And, you know, maybe you're not doing an entire PCDF on your own, but you can also really manage how to manage OR staff, how to manage um, the device company that will be there. It kind of gives you more life skills when you're on your own. Um, accredited does have its advantages too. There are certain work hour rules that go into effect, but the reporting of those is similar. It's probably how we all report our work hours in residency. So I wouldn't read into that too much. Another thing that's really important in terms of fellowship selection is your MIS exposure. Obviously MIS is an extremely hot topic. And what is MIS? Well, I'm not gonna for sure go into all the debate on that, but what I'm referring to is tubular decompression. So doing surgery through a tube, doing perk screws, and really getting good at the lateral approach. I think all those are kind of MIS technologies that everyone should be really comfortable with. One thing you should ask during your interviews or go back and find out if you didn't ask already is who's doing the lateral approach surgeries? Is it a general surgery resident? Is it a general surgery attending? Or is it the actual spine fellow that's doing these approaches? You really should focus on a place where the spine fellow is doing those approaches because in private or in the real world, it's really the spine surgeon that's doing the lateral approach. Um, you can also find a program, if beggars can be choosers, one that does both train psoas and anterior psoas approach. Uh, it's great to be trained in both the, not to use the trade names, but the OLIF and the XLIF approach. Um, I think it's good to have multiple tools because there's different cases where you want to use both. The other thing that's really important is when I say tubular surgery, I am talking about putting a tube down, small 20 or 22 inch um, or 20 millimeter incision going down. I'm not necessarily arguing about the outcomes of what's better, but I do think it's really important to know how to do surgery through a tube. Uh, you might have gone through residency and said, I'm never going to do surgery through a tube. This looks awful. I'm never going to do it. But you need to come out of fellowship being somewhat confident with how to do that and knowing that whether or not that is the future, you need to be pretty good about how to do that. Percutaneous screws is kind of also in this um, argument, indirect decompression, percutaneous screws. You might want to avoid a place that only does big open cases and never does perk screws because you really need to be confident with how to do percutaneous screws and broad placement. You really need to go to a place where you have the autonomy, where you can learn how to understand these 2D fluoro shots and understand how to um, work with your radiology tech to manipulate the machine, like the patient to really get perfect images. I think if you go to a place where the attending is doing all that and the attending is running the show, it's really difficult to understand, you know, how to Ferguson the bed, Fer or Ferguson the machine, rotate the bed to get best shots. And these are just little things that kind of help stop their programs. Another important thing is the amount of exposure to the technology you get. And by this, I'm saying navigation, also robot spine surgery. I'm not saying you necessarily have to go to a place where you do robotic spine surgery, but it is helpful to go to a place where you can learn how to do navigated spine surgery. Uh, again, I'm not arguing whether or not it's better or not better, but it's important just to know that, you know, technology is the future of all fields, especially fine surgery. Um, and it's important to know the skill for doing this. Some of the little things you should try to pick up is how to set up the room for navigation, which rooms at each hospital are good for navigation. Uh, you need to know when there's errors. If you're doing everything and everything on the screen looks perfect, but it doesn't feel perfect, you need to have a good understanding of when maybe the technology isn't matching up with the clinical outcome. And you need to recognize how to get out of trouble when you're doing those things. Uh, the other important part of technology is it's a marketing aspect too. Patients want to go to a place or a surgeon that uses technology because they associate that with better outcomes and shorter hospital stays. 
And whether that's 100% true or not, that's an important thing that we need to think about. So another thing not all programs have, but I think it's a really important thing to get in your training if possible, is to go to a place that has spine trauma and spine call. It's a major benefit for a fellow. You get that many more surgical cases that you get to do. When I say, say spine trauma, you know, there are some of it that are acute fractures, car wrecks, falling off ladders, but something else that people don't necessarily realize as part of spine call is the metastatic tumor lesions, the infections, the IV drug abusers. Those are things that really kind of add volume that create big cases and that need um, relatively urgent care. And when you're a fellow, that's kind of where you kind of get to fly, get to really have a lot of autonomy. You get to make a lot of important decisions during the patient's treatment, and you get to do some pretty big cases for a long period of time. Another big part about the spine call and spine trauma places, you, tells you how, teaches you how to manage these spinal cord injuries. I think it's a fair argument that you could read it in a book and learn it from that way, but when you're really kind of boots on the ground, learning it from your attendings, learning it from those who... And doing this every day that's kind of really you make um, a lot of strides learning how to speak with families about prognosis is an important thing part of any training you kind of start to see that as a medical student really get to do that as a resident but as a fellow really talking about patients and outcomes is something that's really important and also focus on how to um, obtain scattered information from the er docs or floor nurses about a patient and critical decisions when you're on call when you're hearing that over the phone your ability to decipher that and kind of manage it. it's just another little skill you kind of manage as a fellow, and um, you only really get that if you're having the spine call and spine trauma. Your attendings and mentorship, well, that's a huge part also. I think going to a program and almost, you know, many, many, many spine fellowships have these, but finding people that are leaders in the field, the both current stars and also rising stars is a really important thing. Uh, it's great to have a good resource for questions in the years after training. Having a program that has the pioneers in these new technologies and more efficient ways to do procedures is important. It's also great because you can learn a lot of life skills from these people. They've gone through it also, and they're still going through it now. And it's all, it's hard to know prior to being there, but you really want to find people that kind of let you operate on their patients. It's a tough, it's a tough ask, but I think really talking to the current fellows of that program will give you a good idea. So location of the city, I kind of joke that, you know, it's just one year. It's really not that big of a factor. You can make it a factor or not a factor. You know, there's certain places that are desirable, like San Diego, and there's certain places that aren't desirable to live, like, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but certain places aren't desirable. So it's just one year of your life. You know, it's fun. You can make the most of it. Uh, I wouldn't let that be a huge factor. It's just one year. It's not like it's a residency of five years. Research opportunities. Well, I think this is important, but I'm a little biased on this. I think having a program that gives you an avenue um, has a team to help with data collection and statistics is important. Um, you see there's a lot of more big programs that have a large residency program under them is typically, but that's not always the case. A uh, program that has um, the fellowships, the fellows to the research fellowships to allow fellows to kind of jump on that and keep working with them. This also give you access to podiums, invited speaking engagements, and access to conference and podiums. And I think that's important and kind of asking what opportunities they have and do they value research is important. Um, another really key factor that you should ask for is how much deforming or deformity are they doing? Deformity is crucial to a fellowship. It's really they you learn how to manage tough patients, tough complications. Everyone knows the stats: the thirty percent minor complication, ten percent major complication rate. You know, doing the surgery itself is hard, but you learn it pretty efficiently. It's really managing the complications with all spine surgery is really what separates spine surgeons. Not a very young and inexperienced opinion. I think knowing what to do prior to surgery is also a key thing. And going to a, fel a fellowship that really teaches you how to manage patients uh, preoperatively is key. You need to be comfortable with doing PSOs for sure. It's kind of the bread and butter of deformity. And you need to be comfortable with various pelvic fixations. Those are just two specific things that I've kind of gathered post-fellowship that I'm very happy that I got exposure to. Um, here's another interesting slide, I think. So, I've actually talked to a lot of people about this, the program household name recognition. So I think this is a debatable thing. You can really argue this either way. So I'm just gonna talk about it kind of both sides of my mouth. So this might have an advantage in your first 18 months of starting your practice in terms of marketing. And the way I kind of argue it is patients will be impressed if you say you're a spine fellow at Princeton or you're a spine fellow at MIT because everyone knows those names from growing up. But anyone in orthopedics knows that there's no such thing as a Princeton or MIT spine fellow program. So it's almost like saying, and I use this example, if you're a New York City patient and you go online and you find someone that was trained at Leatherman Spine, well, probably most 
patients in New York City don't know what Leatherman Spine is, for instance, yet that's an excellent program. So you can kind of argue it either way. It might help in your first couple months um, in terms of marketing to patients or primary care providers, but surely the training you get, that's gonna be probably more important in my opinion. I don't think most patients are gonna choose a surgeon based on where he or she trained. I think really the important thing to be the referrals you get from other patients, other providers that trust you and like you. Um, so I wouldn't think less of a program if it didn't have a household name recognition. Um, I think the most important factor is really to grow through your practice with great clinical outcomes. So that, I think we're gonna, of course, uh, defer questions to the end, but you know, in summary, I think there really are 12, 20 great programs. There's no perfect program. Some programs have no trauma. Some programs have no MIS. Some programs have no deformity. And that's just kind of how it's gonna be. There's not an all around great program. The other thing, not necessarily on this topic, but one thing that I was really told about when we started is don't wait until the first couple months, four months into practice to where you still start to really appreciate the practice you're in or the, um, the fellowship you're in, start taking notes early, start asking questions early, kind of start the ground running because once you kind of get to November, you should start really be doing things on your own and feeling really confident with things. And that's not when you should start to, um, start to ask questions and start to kind of spread your wings. You should really start doing that from day 